to be able to give them what they come there for, but you need to be, like you said, keep opening the doors, keep opening the doors, keep opening the doors. So different people will come in and that, because otherwise you risk becoming, you know, sclerotic where your, your creative arteries just fill up with plaque and it's the same thing over and over and over again. Then it's just ritualistic. And, and I've gone all over the world and climbed hills and valleys and dales and <laughs> swamps and rain and everything just to find the more original Dasmakov artwork, which uh, comes from the 1400s. And I pretty much stop around the 1800s because after that, it gets too modern for me. It got horrible reviews. I mean, it got one star reviews, half star reviews. You can keep the keep. Keep away from the keep. And those are the headlines, you know. And that's also the title of my book. Hey, guys, you know, come on. Well, also with the horror genre, you can read horror novels and get a completely different experience. It's not formulaic. You can read a Rath James White book, and that's very, very different from a Charles L. Grant book. I think, I agree. And I also think that there's an element of us in that too, right? It's knowing our place, right? This idea, I think there's a megalomania in human nature and a kind of narcissism in human nature, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, Other avenues that, that I want to go down. That's not, it's not like a, a late blooming realization uh i've always had these things that i wanted to explore i wouldn't have done so many different kinds of horror if uh if that wasn't if that compulsion to to keep exploring uh wasn't there or you know and the foray into crime fiction the need for a new horizon is is there rather than just staking out the same turf i think you got a call or a fax from some lady in hawaii she says my sister has just died and I find among her effects a manuscript called The Shadow Out of Time by H.P. Lovecraft. Do you want it? <laughs> and I think if you read a good horror story, it's almost like a, a vacuum cleaner. You know, it, it hoovers up those fears, you know, it gives you, you know, it scares you. You know, I, I think it, in a way it's, it's, it's quite therapeutic and, you know. It... One night the phone rang and it was my dad and he said, um, um, if, if you, if, if you're not busy tonight, um, I've, I've done something I think is pretty good. And I think maybe you and the boys might enjoy it. Um, I, I, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. And it was the Grinch. Arts that seek civilist who responds from within an array of dark emotions. Fear, anxiety, disgust, paranoia, terror, stress, gallows humor, etc. Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live on a special time on Monday. We usually do an 8 p.m. show. Today we're doing a bit early of a show. And just to prove that time travel is not completely impossible, I'm joined today from 2 in the afternoon at 9 a.m. from across the ocean by the great, the legendary Ramsey Campbell. Now, Ramsey Campbell emerged to most readers in the 1970s at a time when Stephen King was still building up his reputation. Uh, the world felt the impact of Ramsey Campbell's first novel, The Doll Who Ate His Mother, but he'd already spent over a decade in the trenches with short fiction, producing some excellent original mythos stories as well as gothic tales. 
he's won just about every fantasy and horror award you can imagine the world fantasy award uh, the british fantasy stoker award international horror guild british fantasy society more than i'm unaware of his work has been adapted to basically every media imaginable and it is with unbelievable pride that i welcome ramsey campbell to visited by voices live hey oh, ramsey oh, how are you doing thanks for having me and incidentally i've not yet had an opera so we, we, we gotta get to that sometime that's that's amazing i, I think he, that has to be a small class of horror writers that can say that they've had that honor to be that's, translated into an opera. that's very true isn't it yeah yeah so we always start these conversations in the same way and i don't want to deviate from formula because that'll throw everyone how did you originally get bit by the horror bug what was that early memory well i guess in terms of adult horror fiction it was when i was six i mean i've already been reading uh things such as you know, hans anderson's tales which i actually found pretty bleak and disturbing in themselves and you know a lot of them were not written for children anyway and i mean i i kind of remember that um the little mermaid for instance you know eventually is carried off to heaven by the angels at the very you know very very last paragraph of that story but what always stuck with me more was you know he felt as if she was walking on broken glass barefoot when she you know separates into a human being and i if you put it this way i was believed more in the broken glass than i did in the angels which probably characterizes me as a, a horror writer right there but six years old i mean my mother let me take books out of the local public library on her tickets and um books that were in the library were apparently respectable I and mean, i couldn't buy pulp magazines but you know uh the hard covers that had been kind of you know smiled upon by the local council were okay i mean little did she know that many of the books i was going to borrow were, were anthologies of stories from those very pulp magazines anyway but that that's by the way so six years old um an anthology called 50 years of ghost stories um now you know there's a huge overlap between the horror the supernatural horror story and the ghost story it seems to be that you know um, there's a, a central territory that is inhabited by much of the greatest stuff in the field both fields if you like and so i was reading mr james i was reading e f benson i was reading Diger. now i also explained i was hideously precocious on top of everything else so i was reading edith wharton um specifically the story afterward in that uh, anthology um and, and i i got it you know, i absolutely got it um and found that extremely chilling but there was there was one thing in particular that stayed in my mind or well, actually two two images from the same story one of which was um somebody opening a chest of drawers one by one and nothing nothing much in the first or second last is a pile of linen and a little pink hand comes groping out of it no explanation and then a bit later the same story somebody who goes into a, a room in pitch darkness or pretty well pitch darkness and feels what appear to be the the, the the feelers of a gigantic insect groping over his face and now the thing was this copy of the book was apparently on loan from a different branch so when i went back and wanted to borrow it again it had gone it was it was years before i managed to identify that story in fact it's a, a relatively obscure mr james story called the residence of whitminster but it kind of lodged in my head right there and i think you know the the the, the very suggestiveness of both of those images were, were were what my imagination fed upon there's one other thing um probably well, I mean, actually, there are several other things. I mean, I read The Color Out of Space the following year, and, and that struck me. That seemed somehow transgressive to me. What The rest of the stuff I'd read was frightening, but I had the sense that this one almost went too far. I had the sense that, you know, if, you, if my mother caught me reading this, you, you say, you, you know, you must read that stuff. It, that's too much. Um, why precisely, I don't know. But again, the, the, the very reticence of Lovecraft's telling of the tale. Um, got to me on, on a more profound a more visceral level if you like uh one other thing that i think is pretty pretty crucial um like this goes back back to this thing about you know pulp magazines being verboten um probably the following year i mean uh, seven years old i think um i'm in southport with my mother southport being a, a seaside resort up the coast here from liverpool and in those days um certainly in britain it was very common to have sort of general storms little 
little mm-hmm. neighborhood shops. That, you know, they'd have cans of peas in the window, and they'd have pulp magazines in the window as, as well, with no apparent contradiction. And there was this magazine in the window that I saw, the cover of which appeared to depict um, a, a, a sort of bird-like creature. Not I thought a bird actually, but a, you know, something like one. Um, in the foreground of a sort of black desert, and behind it, or coming towards it, um, two monstrous things with huge human skulls for heads and kind of rudimentary bodies that let them scuffle along. And I wanted that magazine for sure. You know, but obviously, I didn't get it. You know, seven years old, no chance. Yeah. I turned out to be an issue of weird tales. I mean, like that much I did know and lodged in my brain. You know, so that that logo said with this for years. It wasn't until I Ten years old, I actually got to spend my pocket money on on magazines, and there were you know digest issues of weird tales. Like I, I immediately snaffled it everywhere I could find them. But it wasn't until I guess oh ten years later or so that I, I eventually found this particular issue again, which is a, a 1950s issue. And what it, what the cover shows is a it's not terribly well painted. Well, it's impressionistic, let's say. But uh, what it shows is a vulture in the foreground perched on some bones. And in the background, a couple of human skeletons, which may or may not be on the move. It's difficult to tell. But what seems to me to be the point is that, you know, my imagination, my, my I saw this image and my imagination wanted more. It wanted to be something weirder and, and more disturbing and more uncanny. And so it built on this. And it seems to me this is what I've been doing as a writer ever since. And there's a neat uh, little cross there. Uh, this, as we move through your, the beginning of your writing career, um, 1962, you sell a story called The Church on High Street mm-hmm. um, to August Derleth, who, of course, was the man who enshrined Lovecraft's legacy. Um, controversial figure among, I guess, Lovecraft fans in some ways, but I don't think we'd have the legacy at all without him. So, sure. um, And that's for an anthology called uh, Dark Mind, Dark Heart. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, right. so basically, that's a Weird Tales connection right there. I mean, that's not even Seven Degrees with Kevin Bacon. That's like Kevin <laughs> turned around and looked in a mirror. <laughs> yeah. That had to have been a huge thrill and very validating. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the 1960s were a time when Lovecraft was getting renewed interest in the colleges, uh, certainly in America. I'm imagining also in Britain. Yes. Yes. Um, it was that. I mean, you'd already have discovered Lovecraft by then, which is put you way ahead of the pack. But did your uh, appreciation of weird f- fiction and cosmic horror really um, ramp up at that time? Yes, very much so. Because you again, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sure most people now are going to have difficulty unless they were there at the time imagining this. But in, in 1960, by 1960, there was no, there had never been a paperback collection of Lovecraft published in Britain. I mean, now you know, Penguin Modern Classics and and Library of America and all sorts of places, but not then. And it was one one collection called Cry Horror, apparently. Um, uh, Uncredited uh, editor was Don Walheim, who'd put it together for Avon back in the 40s as The Lurking Fear, actually. Mm-hmm. Retitled on the, on the reissue as Cry Terror, with a great Richard Powers cover. And again, I saw this in, in another one of these, you know, kind of general store windows. And, um, you know, snaffled it immediately for half a crown, having, you know, picked it in my pocket in, in, in terror of, of not having the amount of, of money I needed, but yeah, I just had. And I took that home and actually I just skived off school the next day and I sat and read the entire thing from cover to cover. And I basically thought not merely that Lovecraft was the greatest horror writer I'd ever read, I thought he was the greatest writer that I'd ever read <laughs> at, that, at that moment. And you know, I was imbued with this, and you know, I, I I knew I think that this is what I wanted to write. Now it didn't happen all at once because I was already doing stuff of my own, which was not very good, and actually was imitating other writers. Um, but I know by the time I I was turning fifteen, I think I started writing Lovecraft imitations. Now they are they are the, those first drafts are are well, some of them are really pretty dire. Um, but, you know, I sent them to August 1st, basically, well, in fact, what I did was I sent him a letter at, at the behest of an old friend of mine, Pat Kearney, then a, then a, a fellow fan and, and now a distinguished bibliographer. 
Um, and he, he has a, a fanzine editor. He suggested I should send the, ask Dillard what he thought of them. So I just sent Dillard a letter saying, basically, you know, you're the authority. Um, would you be prepared to read these and say if they are any good? I was really not looking for publication. Got the, well, basically, I was a letter back saying, well, look, we hold the copyright on, on, on the mythos which is a controversial point, but anyway, that's what he said. Um, and so we need to see them before you can think of publishing. But once he'd read them, he, he, he sent me this long letter saying, you know, these need work, and here's some of the work that needs to be done. But if you do this, and if you, you know, write um, more of the same, this could be a potential Arkham House book. Now, what I think is this, you know, in um, on reflection was that, it was a classic case of being in the right place at the right time because he'd been writing Lovecraft pastiches of his own, obviously, mm. ever, since, uh, ever since Lovecraft died. And to some extent, he'd been publishing them latterly as a way of keeping Lovecraft's name alive and, you know, basically, you know, giving people something that was new and Lovecraftian. But he, as I learned from our correspondence, which we kept up until his death, you know, he, at this point, had felt pretty well written out in this area and uh, you know along comes this kid who's now trying to do the same thing and who you know with with editorial help can do it and obviously you know that was exactly what he needed right then so you know i, I could hardly have been better timed i think it's a couple of years then before dalhu ate her mother there comes out um oh, that's God, 70, that, really? 76 because, wow. well, so, yeah, because in the first book, The Inhabitant, that's 64. And so, you know, I didn't really attempt a novel for another, ooh, 11 years before I started writing that one. Yeah, but that book changes everything for you, doesn't it? I mean, that kind of opens the door. Oh, well, not immediately. I mean, <laughs> the sales were ter terrible and the reviews were worse. So, no, it was, it was not an immediate thing. No, not quite. But, you know, people, some people did like it. Um, so I, I do, really, you know, encouraged by my publishers, uh, set out and, to write the my second novel, which was The Face That Must Die. Mm -hmm. um, and almost to a person, the publishers who had done the first one said, no, we can't touch this. It's too grim, you know, go and do something else. So um, it wasn't until I wrote The Parasite. Um, and I have to confess that was, you know, to some extent a commercial concoction. With, with input from my agents on both sides of the Atlantic, which I now had by now, you know, um, that the, the things took off. And that did, you know, make a bit, a bit of a, a splash. And of course, Steve King was very enthusiastic. And so was Peter Straub. Um, and I, I'm quite certain those were a considerable help. And that was the point at which I, uh, I, I actually, you know, started making it, if you like. But if Jenny, my wife, had not been teaching, um, you know, we you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be doing it. You know, for, I went full time in 1973 and didn't really start making it until 79. So that's a, that's a stretch. Between those two periods, though, between Doll and um, a Face That Must Die and To Wake the Dead, and mm -hmm. uh, although the 79 to 83 period where you kind of are. Um, Becoming a big name on both sides of the ocean, I think it's fair to say. You did something else, and I, I want to clear up something that still persists as an open question. So I would like okay. a definitive answer here. Okay. You write three novels for Universal based on classic Universal monster films. That's right. But there's five in the line. I just want to be clear that mm -hmm. Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula's Daughter, and Wolfman are yours, and that Creature from the Black Lagoon and Werewolf of London are not. They belong to Walter Harris. That's right, but there's also um, The Mummy, and nobody knows who wrote that anymore. Even Pierce Dungeon, who was the commissioning editor at the time, even he can't remember, sadly. And because the publisher's long defunct, even the contract's not there to be consulted. So we shall never know. But it wasn't me, I can tell you that. So Carl Dreadstone was uh, the line pseudonym. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, were, were you at least well paid for, for the work? No. Okay, I expected that answer. <laughs> but I, I will tell you what. I, right I, you know, I mean, well, Peggy, that's what we really mean, because I wrote each of those novels in about a month, the fastest I've ever gone, you know, because I was using the original films. And also I had the original screenplays 
to work from. And I tried to keep as much of both as I possibly could, particularly, you know, to, not to deviate from the, the film. Although I did uh, put a, a, a scene into uh, The Wolfman, the scene of the bear at the, in, the, in the fairground that was in the screenplay. It was apparently filmed, but apparently for whatever reason they decided to drop it uh, a bit like the spider pit in King Kong, you know, that, so it, 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 it's lost, I think, to, to history. Uh, so I did include that because I thought it did it did work. The other thing I did do with the Wolfman, um, which I, because I did find this very interesting, that in the screenplay, Kurt Siodmak specifies and he specifies this in all capital letters. So he's obviously very serious about it that we should only ever see the werewolf from his viewpoint, you know, in reflections or in water. So you know you could assume it could be some kind of psychological condition. Now obviously the universal went you know for something much more unambiguous. But it's interesting that, um, you know, Val Luton then starts producing his great movies at, at RKO. And they are much more in the spirit of what Siodmak presumably intended in The Wolfman. And Siodmak then goes over then writes for Luton. So, um, so I, you know, that was one aspect of the, the whole thing that I did want to keep in the novel. Well, I have to say, Bride of Frankenstein is my favorite film. Uh -huh. and, uh, that is a dream job, right? Mm, to adapt. Yeah. Um, did you, I mean, I ha, unfortunately I don't have a copy of your Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, really? uh, were you able to um, re-include the murder plot with the Glenn, uh, with the Dwight Fry character or was, did you go by the finished film? The finished film, because there is that episode, you mean, where where one of the villagers kills his family. And then his brother's family, family yeah. It, but it's, what's that Dwight Fry in fact? I didn't know. So, uh, Everything I've read implies that yeah. that is supposed to be the character because there's a scene that is still in the film yes. of him in the town, and it seems like he's just done something. That's true, isn't it? Now, you know, that hasn't really occurred to me, but yeah, yeah, now no, no, I take your point. I, I didn't include that because it seemed to be to slow the thing down. Um, Which is why they took it out, so yeah, you're probably exactly. right. <laughs> but, you know, it's a pity in a way that I didn't, I suppose. That's right. So you also have an interesting, I mean... To be clear, you published nearly 40 novels. I guess, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because there's so many mis, uh, retitlings in your line that it's a little bit hard for me to exactly decipher. Because unfortunately, I haven't read everything. I'm, I'm always very honest about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, looking at your bibliography as opposed to a lot of classic writers' bibliographies, the one thing I'm just – I find remarkable is the consistency at which you've put out work. Mm. Uh, yes, we all talk about Stephen King and the fact that, you know, once a year in time for Christmas, there's going to be a book. We know that, yeah, that's right. but he, that's a different sort of beast than normal. Um, you look at a, a lot of your contemporaries and it's, uh, there's pe dry periods and there's gaps and that's mm. just not the case with you. <laughs> you've worked consistently since you know the mid 70s i'm yeah. it's, it's a remarkable run it, 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 it's a compulsion you see I'm, I'm serious when i say that you know it really is you know if i don't write for any length of time i get terribly sort of you know, edgy and impatient and frustrated so yeah you know, i gotta do it and one other thing one of, the, one of many other things but you know when 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 writing whatever the present novel might be i always want to know what the next one is going to be about at least and maybe even be you know developing it in a general sense in my notebooks um so that i have that kind of sense of where i'm going to be next year to you know I, otherwise again I, I get rather sort of uneasy you know and i i think that only ever happened to me in the last hmm, 30 years or so once when i suddenly thought my god i don't know what next year's going to hold for me so you know i'd better come up with something and i duly did so um it was a book called Thieving Fear, actually. But that, that was, um, you know, it has to be said, that, you know, that was something I constantly to generate as being, you know, next year's novel. It's funny you mentioned Thieving Fear because that's the follow-up to a book that, again, served as another spike, at least on this side of the ocean, hmm. in your career. Whereas when Grin of the Dark came out, that really, event again, people were talking Ramsey Campbell. Uh -huh. And it, it was a period where... You know, we're talking about uh, the leisure years had, well, I guess we were still in the leisure years mm -hmm. where leisure paperbacks had, had made a dedicated line and you weren't part of that. But 
it was yeah. that time period and it seemed like there was a new class coming in of writers and then hey ramsey's back and <laughs> we're all talking about ramsey campbell again right, right. and this has happened several times in your career i mean more than several times actually but uh that novel in particular really found its audience really well at least over here did oh, you feel that at the time well i'm very fond of that but it's it kind of interesting because that was one um how, how can I put this exactly? That was when I just decided, I'm just going to do this because I, you know, the idea appeals to me. And I don't know if this is going to be, you know, any good. And if it's any good, I don't know if it's going to be, you know, any have any commercial uh, footage, you know, um, uh, whatever it would happen. God, I can't see. see you're seeing stability now before your very eyes. The, the language is beginning to desert me, just as it does the character in the grin of the dark, you see. So even mentioning it, you know, infects you with, with, with its bug. Um, but no, it was just purely, because I originally wrote it for Pete Crowther at PS Publishing. PS Publishing, yeah. Pete, you know. So, you know, it might only ever have been uh, a limited edition, little did I know, as you say, but that, uh, you know, folk would like it. And it, um, that's how we got it back into print. I think I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't see that again quite soon. Uh, I think there's a, a an entire another generation that's come up now of readers that would be completely ready for it. And I think it's a title that has enough of a reputation that you'd do very well with it. Uh -huh, we do right. have some questions starting to come through the chat, so I want to make sure we get to them. So yeah. I'm going to try and take them at the point where it makes most sense in the conversation, but a couple of them already work. So okay. let's uh, hit up our friend Dan St Dan Shine, uh, Flesh Wound Features, actually, uh, in with saying, asking, growing up and getting into horror world at a young age, were you able to find your tribe of like-minded friends right away? Yeah, well, there were friends at school, a couple, you know, who, re who read horror. Well, not that early, no. Actually, probably not until I got to high school or grammar school, you know, as, as, we, as we call it in Britain, you know, which is a, a different thing from what it is in America. Um, what, once I got, got there, yes, there were other friends of the guy, Kevin Bulger, who I've sadly lost touch with of late, um, lost touch with quite a while ago. But he was a, you know, he was an equal a Lovecraft fan. We you know, we, 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 we talked horror a lot and, and once we were able to sneak well quite sneak but bluff our way into horror movies because in those <laughs> days, you know, I remember. In, in Britain, you had to be sixteen theoretically to get in. So that's what the X meant in those days in Britain. So really if you were fourteen you could Probably well, most cinemas were not that uh, st you know strict in 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 asking for your ID. In fact, I don't think any of them did. And so we you know we start we started picking up on on the, the classic Hammer films pretty well on the, at the time of their release. And 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 uh, so yeah, to that extent. And then the other thing was, um, I think I was saying a bit earlier, you know, the oh, no, I didn't ex quite explain this. The, the, the I was a member of the British Science Fiction Association. And um, that was how Pat Kearney and I got in touch because uh, the the librarian, the postal librarian, uh, Peter Maybe, uh, he put us in touch because we we were the only two who were borrowing issues of weird tales, you know, uh, by post. So you know, clearly we were as weird as each other, and he, yeah. you know, he, he he put us in touch. And then not very long after, or probably just around the same time. So after, again, we're talking maybe 16 years old. I joined the local science fiction society, but again, you know. A fair number of people in there also read horror, and so yeah, I, I mean, I sort of found my folk in my mid-teens, I suppose, in the main. Yeah, um, now I guess it's much easier because you know, because online, really, you can you, you can pretty soon find your your kindred spirits. Back then, no, we couldn't do it. Yeah, Jacob asks your stories the chimney and the companion deal with adults reflecting on their childhood fears yeah. are there things that scared you as a child that continue to scare you now um probably not so much no i, I guess those stories are i mean partly what those stories are doing i think is reminding us what it feels like to be a you know a child the vulnerability of children if you like which is you know something i i, I often write about i think you know, the recurring theme, um, but I mean, no, I think I probably overcome most of my my childhood fears. I mean, my my childhood my childhood was was distinctly a place of unease. You know, my my um, my parents lived together, but my father they were estranged, so I didn't actually see my father face to face for near the whole of my life. And you know, he was still in this very small house, but he was kind of the footsteps going upstairs in the night or coming upstairs in the night when I was younger. You know presence on the other side of the door and um, 
my mother was, I'm afraid to have to say this, but an undiagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, increasingly so. And so, you know, she was, I was almost having to deal with the fact that, no, there weren't really messages in the ra on, coming on the radio that were intended specifically for her. So at a very early age, I guess, I don't know, three years old, um, I had to sort out what she perceived from what was real. So I suppose the truth or the answer to the question of why is that while these things do not still frighten me, you know, I've sort of come to terms with them, they still do shape what I write about. Um, and I'm still, you know, imaginatively aware of what those fears feel like, but I don't directly experience them anymore. You are beyond the novels, which again, incredibly consistent, you, a lot of work, but beyond that, you are one of the most prolific publishers of short stories in the genre ever. So there are 26 and thought, uh, single author collections of your work. Really? <laughs> You've counted. I haven't. But I, I, I did. I did because at a certain point I didn't believe it. I expect, you know, you come on, I'm going to find six or eight because as someone with a career your length, that's very possible. Is that a ominous number, twice 13? Are we, are we giving a look at <laughs> That that is not just a lot of stories, but the remarkable thing is there's there's less you know re uh, like crossover pollution between them. They mm -hmm. are pretty much self-contained to eras. Um, that's an amazing achievement. I want your thoughts on the short story as a form mm -hmm. because unfortunately it's suffering and has been suffering for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, there just aren't the markets for it. Readers consistently are not seeking out short fiction as much as they seek out novels. Mm -hmm. And it seems odd for horror, which seems like would work in digest form better um, yeah. than in a, a long form like a novel. But you've worked on both sides of it consistently, mm -hmm. very consistently. What What's your thoughts? Uh, is the short story format just kind of doomed or do you think that it'll eventually take its rightful place which i think along with the novella is a lot higher profile than it is right now no i think i think it will always it will, it will always be with us you know just like horror will always be with us um i think particularly in this field i i think there still are a fair number of anthologies i mean there's a there's a tremendous one coming from tor or from you know nightfire the the horror imprint called dark stars edited by john taff uh, that will be in the oh, excuse me, in November, I do believe. Um, and you know, Mammoth Book of Best New Horror still continues. Ellen Datlow's you know, uh, Best Horror Anthology, that uh, annual anthology, that that that's mm -hmm. still with us. Um, I mean, I guess some of the magazines, uh, sadly, you know, Black Static is is in its its final issues apparently, which is a great pity, I think. But um, I know I, I I genuinely think it has still enough life in it that. Because the other odd thing is that, that publishers are forever announcing that anthologies don't sell. And yet, you know, we still keep seeing anthologies, you know, decades after they've said this. So somehow there must be, you know, at least some, some sort of audience out there. Now, whether it's a superior form for horror, I'm not very sure. I think they're different. I think, you know, the, the effect of a short horror story and, and that of a horror novel, they're, they're very different, certainly. But... I think they both have their you know, individual strengths and the developer too, as you as you as you say. That's uh, I mean that's some of the greatest work in the field. You know, whether it's you know the Willows, the White People, the novellas of Ted, Ted Klein, uh, of, of Robert Aikman, and so forth. You know, so it's a, that's a very a, a very strong form for the for the genre. But no, I think you know. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I I'm going to say that they they all still have life as far as I can see. Well, that's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Um, and on that note, before we get into your work as an editor, which I am blown away by as well, but we're gonna—I'm gonna take a brief uh, detour because I, I have to do what I do on every show where I have a guest that uh, I am fortunate enough to have a moment with. Is that um, one of my great prides in my life as a writer was being able to appear in an anthology, Horror for Good, which was a charity anthology. And mm -hmm. what the really remarkable thing is that um, I don't know if you if we can see it, but yes, you're in focus there. Yes, there yeah. Are, there so, yes, yes. I mean, if you see, if you've seen that lineup, Lauren Dixon, Ramsey Campbell, Wrath James, uh, James White is kind of an insane thing. If you look a little bit further down, Jack Ketchum, 
Ray Garten was there. I think the short story needs to be a lot more prominent in the field. And I think people who don't read novels because they don't have that kind of time need to reinvest in the short story. Mm -hmm. It's important. It gives a lot of um, writers coming up opportunities to, for, uh, a little, to share a marque, right? Yes, yes. And exactly. I think that is important. Just as oh, you... Oh, but why is there something walking about behind you? Uh, that is my 17-year-old cat, Stormcloud. I see. Yes, I see. Or her, depending. <laughs> she, yeah, she's a tortoise shell, so she's a she. Okay. she she's, don't worry, she will not attack anything. <laughs> she can't get through the screen. That's the main thing. That's the main uh, thing. You're uh, not a fan of cats? I know. I love cats. I love cats. Okay. I'm only kidding. Only kidding. Okay. Um... But I do think short stories have an important role to play in our genre. I just would like to see them embraced a little bit more firmly. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I suppose this, you know, given the fact that we do have two annual anthologies of the best, with actually very little overlap. I mean, that in itself, I think, suggests that you know, uh, there's, there's plenty of vigor still out there. You know. Yeah. Um, for yourself, though, as an editor. Uh, you are responsible for two lines that were really, really, really influential in their time. Uh, New Terrors and Best New Horrors, um, in particular, amazing. In New Terrors, you published Steve Ramzik Tam, Manly mm -hmm. Wade, Wade Wellman, Tanith Lee, Graham Masterton, uh, Dennis Etchison, Carl Edner Wagner, which you just mentioned as an editor, as an incredibly important editor in his own right, Robert Block, Steve King, Charles Grant. On the best new horror side, Thomas Lagodi, Kim Newman, Brian Lumley, Richard Lehman, Doug Clegg, uh, David Chow, Robert McCammon, Kathy Kojo, William Nolan, Peter Straub, <laughs> Melanie Tem, F. Paul Wilson. I mean, that's pretty much modern horror in a nutshell, is it not? I think so, yes. Although I'm, I'm just going to say, you know, that as far as best new horror went, that it was Steve Jones. My old friend Steve Jones, you know, did did really more of the work on those than I did. So, you know, I, we we, we got to give him the accolade. I think that's fair. What kind of view from from that forty thousand feet did uh, working on those projects? So, did it give you of the genre? Oh well, it's a very. I mean, my, my my view of the whole thing has always been very capacious. You know, uh, I, I, I I genuinely define horror very widely. And I have done actually, uh, this is another formative experience ever since I was 11. And I came across Herman Melville's Bartleby in, in a book, you know, the, um, the, an anthology called Best New Horror, where the anthologist you know, apologized in advance to the reader uh, on the basis that many people would not think this was a horror story. And 11 years old, I actually felt it did fit. So I mean, I, I think that was, that was a shaping experience right there for me. And so, you know, looking down on all the things I was trying to edit, particularly for new terrors, um, there was a, I had a real sense of, you know, of how wide, how broad a, a field it is. The other thing I, you know, I, I like very much to do is try and, I mean, I'm very, one of the things I'm proudest of, really, I suppose, is, is, is kind of helping new writers. And in some ways, in some cases, I think, upon, you know, it was actually somebody, the, the debut of several so the professional debut of, of several writers. So, you know, you were saying Steve Tem, there was Mark Laidlaw, um, in the more recent anthology, uh, Gathering the Bones, you know, I co-edited that with uh, Dennis Etchison and Jack Dan. And I actually managed to do the first ever short story professionally published by Adam Neville. So look, well, look at where he's gone since. And I, you know, I, I take some pride in that. And you know, if I can help new writers, that's uh, because, you know, I, I, I kind of like to feel that that's part of the, the continuity that I try and represent. You know, I was helped by August Derleth and other people, you know, guys like Robert Block, you know, um, in, in you know promoting my stuff early on. And I want to pass that on to other people. And of course, going back, you know, Derleth was, was, was aided by Lovecraft as a correspondent. So, so I hope the continuity goes on. Absolutely. Um, Daniel actually has another question for you. Uh, and this is something I was going to get to, but I, do, I didn't want to bring it up, fr up front because. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what are your feelings on the three film adaptations of your work? They influence the nameless and the second name. Uh, do you feel they properly captured the spirit of the stories? Now, now uh, 
Well, go ahead. Uh, what, what do you think of those three things, films? And then I guess we can discuss. Well, I think Spirit, yes. And it's interesting because, I mean, the nameless, uh, Los Sin Nombre, uh, Jabba Balaguero, who, you know, who wrote, directed the film, he actually jettisons all the supernatural element of the original novel, The Nameless. Now, you know, I, I was a bit taken aback, but the fact is it works, you know. And what he said he wanted to do was communicate the sense of dread that he found in the novel. And I certainly think he does that. I mean, I, I, I gather that they shot the, the finale. The, um, it took about a week and they shot it on location in, in an abandoned motel outside Barcelona, and that they themselves found this actually quite an unnerving experience to spend a week in there. So it, and it certainly comes across on the screen to me. Um, second name, well, this is an odd one, because basically that is based on the first draft of the novel. Um, the, the version, well, oh, no, I beg your pardon, not quite the first draft, but the first submitted draft of the novel. Now, I'd sent that to... Melissa Singer at Tor, and um, it was really pretty bad. Um, and Melissa sent me the longest editorial letter I've ever had in my life, several thousand words in an email. And she was like, like she was right, like 99% of it. In fact, once I began to put her, her ideas into, into, um, into practice, I actually saw there was more wrong with the book. So I did more, 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 more yet that she'd not suggested. And so the book is quite largely well, it certainly improved on, on the, the draft that the guys at Filmax in Spain saw and on which they based the film. But the point was, you know, by the time the screenwriter had finished, you know, putting it into a better form, which it certainly needed, it, it doesn't have a great deal to do with the novel. And if, I have to say, you know, if I'd seen that film with no connection with my novel, I actually wouldn't have thought this is a film of my novel. So, you know... So, um, but, you know, I, I understand why that is. Um, more recently, the influence, I find fantastic, that Influencia, you know, for Netflix, which I hope is going to see a Blu-ray sometime soon. Um, yeah, again, the, very much the spirit of the novel, I think. And again, you know, um, uh, the, the, the sort of dread I was trying to convey in the book is, is certainly up there on the screen. So, yeah, I've also always taken the view that I'd far rather have a, a film, a good film in its own right, than a dull film that's, you know, faithful to the to illustrating the book. I mean, the book and the film, they're different entities, they're different art forms, I haven't say, and there's no reason why one should cleave to the other. So I'm kind of happy that they're good movies, basically. I think it's it's captures a, a really uncomfortable attitude and um, atmosphere really well. Like that movie has some swagger to it, but it's also really the first one uh, yeah yeah is is really pretty dark uh, in the right ways and yeah, i think that's yeah. a beautiful beautiful thing um now as far as films uh, a weird i something i wouldn't have seen coming a million miles away from you is in 2010 you adapt the solomon kane movie ah uh, yes 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 you got to help me with this <laughs> Well, it was basically, you know, that back in 75, 76, um, it was, the Howard Estate commissioned me via Kirby McCauley, who was my agent, uh, to, to, to complete three Solomon Kane stories that Robert E. Howard had left unfinished. And I duly did this. And that you can find those, I'm sure, in, you know, I don't know they're in print right now, but you can certainly find them easily enough. Um, and so it was because of that that the guys involved in making the Solomon Kane film approached me to do the novelization. Actually, there is another strange little thing uh, in between, which was Mil Milton Subotsky of Amicus. He approached me to write a screenplay uh, for a Solomon Kane movie, um, which ultimately didn't get made, partly because I, I think quite rightly he said that he felt there were problems with my screen treatment. But also, uh, he was going to make a, a Lynn Carter movie, and apparently the, the money for the special effects fell out from under it, so he got stuck with the bill and no film, and so you know, the Solomon came went into limbo. But, you know, as far as the, the new, the other Michael Bassett movie is concerned, yeah, it was just that they presumably approached me on the basis of having had some association with Solomon Kane, and again, it was a bit like the Brian, the, the, well, the Universal, you know, the Dreadstone books, that um, that, that I had a chance to read all the drafts 
of the screenplay, and there were bits that he would have liked to include in the film, but you know they actually either didn't have the time or the budget, and so there were some scenes that I did put back into the novel that he would have liked to be in the film. So I had again quite a good time with that, and again that was another kind of I think that was really a five-week write in that case, but it was a you know it was a rush to get the thing into print in order to time with the film, but we just managed it. We have uh, someone just wanting to say hello. Hey, there, are two the more. Well, by gum. Well, let me explain this. I mean, uh, this is going to mean more to to the to the, the person whose name we don't have, but um, but but Chilwell Library, Chilwell Local Public Library, was the very place where I got that first taste of adult horror fiction you know when i was six it was and back then it wasn't even a purpose-built building it was just one of a of a terrace of shops so it's just a a shop premises um with with a library inside it and that was where i well where i got all my books where i borrowed all my library books for the first oh i guess three or four years of my you know public library borrowing so chillwall yes that was just up the road from me i was i was in uh, just off Thingwall Road in, in Nook Rise is, is where I was at. And um, so I, I guess we were lived within oh, miles of one another. All right. So more recently, you have um, started a relationship with Flame Tree Press, mm -hmm. which is yeah. bringing uh, some more recent work uh, to a new audience. And... Um, the Searching Dead is the beginning of the, the proper, I guess, trilogy, as it were. It is, it is. Um, which, there we go. Yeah, there are three, that's right. And these are extraordinarily nice additions for the trade paperback form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so ha in a world where so many people are seeing the uh, the world of publishing changing so rapidly, how do you continue to get in the right place to have editions like this come out? I mean, you've deserved it and you've earned it, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean a whole lot in our world, I don't think. So <laughs> is it diligence? Is it connections? Is it just, how do you continue to manage just a career at the top level for so many years? Well, I think the last few, well, I mean, uh, tour, tour, of course, of my publishers for, oh, you know, a couple of, a couple of about getting on for a couple of decades. Oh, gosh, no, longer than that. Good heavens, how long were they my publishers? No, the, no they, they took me out of the early 80s, and it was, you know, well into this century that we were there. And then the, the, the great and good Don Doria, uh, who, you know, was originally at Leisure, and then we went to Sam Hain, and then I followed him now to, to Flame Tree. And uh, I've got to say, I'm as, I'm as delighted with Flame Tree as with any publisher I've ever had. I mean, they, the, Don and Nick Wells there and, and the whole team very much on the ball and as he, as you say you know that and, and as we just saw that the look of that trilogy um is something special i think and that you know that, that they're, they're, they're going to look very striking when all three of them are out there together on the shelf once once, once all three of those books see print but no i mean I, I i could not be happier with flame tree so basically yes it is connected to some extent and it's, and it's having a publisher who's that enthusiastic about what you do so, you know, I think I'm very lucky in, 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 in being with them. And and definitely Don Dioria is good people. <laughs> that, that that certainly helps. A lot of um, editors modernly run into trouble in this genre. And he's one of those guys that's navigated through pretty mm -hmm. brilliantly. Um, worked with a lot of big names, nothing, none as big as you, but uh, a lot of big names. So can you tell us a little bit about your, about The Wise Friend? Yes. Well, that's the wise friend rather than searching dead. Yeah, we're talking about the wise friend. Uh, that is my. Let me see. <laughs> I just have to work this out. You see, see once again, senility, senility is manifest before you. Yes, that is my most recent novel to be published. That's right. We'll see a, we'll see a new one in June from Flame Tree, but the wise friend is is the one that's out there right now. Okay, it is about um, it, it is about the the protagonist's aunt, deceased aunt. Uh, was a painter with a penchant for surrealism and toward the end of her career the occult and it becomes increasingly clear that she had had experiences of the occult and these fascinate not merely the narrator 
but his teenage son. And when the narrator decides that actually this is too dark to, to continue to research, his son and his new girlfriend continue the search. And so our, 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 our narrator, uh, Patrick, um, is, is increasingly and broadly trying to stop what it's clear is going to happen. Uh, so, you know, by, 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 by searching with this stuff, they're bringing stuff back into the world. And, uh, you know, that her connection with the occult was much darker and stranger than, um, than, than we originally know. Now, um, I, I'm kind of fond of that book, actually. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that there are sort of the, the, the uncanny set pieces are what, um, what, what I especially like. But I, th I think there's a kind of a thread, thread of eeriness running through that book that that's pretty consistent. And, you know, that's the kind of thing, but I guess that's the kind of thing I most like to do. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to make sure we highlighted the more recent books is because there's a subject I wanted to broach with you. Your sense of prose has been wonderfully in the moment since those early days, but it has evolved. Yeah. Sure. Your storytelling voice today is you can still hear you, mm -hmm. but say take um, obsession or incarnate mm -hmm. and, and compare them with the searching dead and wow there there's there is a, a a difference in voice there is yeah. that something that happened naturally or was that something you uh planned to do or w did you look at the market and say hey this would work better or how did that work uh, no i think i think it's pretty organic i think as you say you know it has developed over the over the oh, over the decades over 60 years pretty well um and i've sort of tried to refine it Basically, um, as I go along, you know, it's a kind of a halting and and and, and you know haphazard process, I think. But 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 that, that's what I've still tried to do. And I, I suppose one one significant thing is probably that I I rewrite these days far more than I used to. I mean, some of that early stuff, um, I wish I could have back. Well, I could have it back theoretically, you know, and and you take it apart and start again. I think the problem is if you start doing that, you lose whatever is there. As well as you know, you might you might get rid of the stuff that is is clunky, but you're probably also going to get rid of the stuff that that presumably still has some some power to it. And so you know, I, I tend to leave well alone and just try and try and do again, or try you know have another go at what I feel I didn't get right that time round. And this is particularly true of the the trilogy actually, because you know I I kind of felt that looking back on my first collection, you know, the inhabitant of the lake which is, you know, is thoroughly Lovecraftian. And I've, 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 you know, there's still, I still love that whole sense of cosmic terror that, that I get from Lovecraft and Blackwood and, and, and Hope Hodgson and so forth, you know. Um, but I felt I really wasn't equipped to do it justice when I was 16 years old. And so I've gone back to some of those things that I invented and tried to, you know, to, to, to develop them along the lines I'm now, now capable of doing. And the result is indeed the, the Searching Dead. Um, and it's a kind of strange, I didn't have to go to me until now as I speak to you, really. But I suppose in a way, you know, it's reaching back in a number of ways, that trilogy, in the sense that, you know, in the one sense, it's reaching back to my, my original ideas. Because it's also reaching back to how old I, or, you know, the, the, the age I was approximately when I started conceiving that kind of fiction. So it's a sort of, you know, dual autobiography, if you like, although the character is not directly autobiographical, you know, certainly there are elements that are, and the whole sense of what it was like, you know, in Britain and Liverpool, specifically, you know, in the early 1950s, that, that for sure is true. And um, I guess that's, you know, kind of lived experience that I'm finally able to draw on completely. Well, now you did it. You mentioned Arkham House again, so I'm, I'm going to have to go there for another question. Sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned Inhabitant of the Lake and Less Welcome Tenants. Uh, so that book is out in 64, and it was edited by Frank at Patel. Oh, it was not edited. It was the cover by Frank. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I, I had some information on that's not correct then. Oh, no. No, I mean, but it, what was, what was, was the editor. Sorry. Dillis was the editor. He was but still he, the editor. Okay. That makes yeah, a little bit more it, sense it, then. It didn't actually really change. Uh, you know, that very first story, the, the Church in High Street, he did edit that. Because he felt, you know, it needed it, and certainly did by gum. But he, you know, partly as a way of showing me how to do it, and then he left me alone 
to you know re rewrite the other early drafts of the inhabitant stories and he actually changed about i think six words or so in the final published version of inhabitant which incidentally ps publishing in britain you know they, they brought out the definitive edition which includes the title as it was originally supposed to be which was as and other unwelcome tenants you know rather than and less welcome because you know you can't really imagine very many that would be less welcome you know <laughs> that that went wrong that was that was the thing about frank Uppertal. in fact that may be what you had in mind was that derva sent him the title brief to on which to base the cover but Durr sent him the wrong title, the wrong subtitle, if you like. And by the time, you know, I sort of done it was because it was too late, too expensive to change because they'd been they'd been printed up those those dust wrappers. Um, but the the PS edition also includes all the first drafts of those stories, um, you know, for the first time anywhere for those who find that kind of thing interesting. Yeah, and if anyone is interested, PS press is just amazing editions of books um again i've been lucky enough to be in one anthology we covered that on the last episode actually um speaking with mike arnson but uh they are amazing so if you want really good looking books in hardcover ps press is definitely a no-brainer not cheap but sometimes you have to pay for quality right mm -hmm. so ramsey Oh. You have a great perspective on this genre, having been involved in it for such an important stretch of time. Where do you see the future? What What do you think is coming for this genre? Do you, I mean, it's never been as, it's never been as big as it's been in some ways, and it's never been as small in other ways. So, where do you see it? Ah, that's a killer question for which I can never find much of an answer. You know, if I if I, if I could see it, I would I would. I don't know. I would I would try and travel into that future, I suppose. I, I just think, you know, it, it every so often it's buried by by the mainstream or by, you know, by the trade and then it rises, it scrabbles back out of its own grave yet again. So all I can really say is I don't think we shall ever die, you know. Even even if we're a bit undead, we're we're gonna carry on. In what form? I have no real idea, but um I, I, I believe in its uh, I believe in its staying power. I I believe all that too, and I'm also very hopeful. I think there's a lot of great voices out there to carry us through the yeah. future, and that's not always been as obvious as it is right now. So that's to be mm -hmm. thankful for. I always allow the last question whenever I can to become from the community. Um, in this case, I'm going to play a little bit of Dirty Pool. Mark uh, Allen Gunnels is in the chat, and he, obviously he is the guest on this show on the 5th, a great writer in his own uh, right. Sure and he is. has the final question, and that is, how has the publishing world changed since you started? Hey there, Mark. Oh, gosh. Well, um, I suppose one major change was, well, okay, when I came into the field, you know, you would be published by someone like Arkham House, and actually there weren't many like Arkham House in this field. Or very possibly not at all. You know, there were the, the mainstream publishers, with very very few exceptions, wouldn't really touch the field over much. I mean, it's it. it we may recall going back a, a bit further, of course, but that nobody wanted to do Lovecraft originally uh, in, in hardcover, and that's why Arkham House came about in the first place. Um, came the seventies, horror began to you know gather momentum. By the mid seventies, it was. You know, becoming huge, which is you know something I benefited from certainly as as a writer. And then you know came the really came I suppose the mid 90s, and it imploded. All of a sudden, nobody wanted to know. Even even the editors who loved it, you know, that they had to say no, no, we can't buy it. You know, I I know there are friends of mine in the field, you know, editors in the field who were dismayed in the extreme by this you know and, and so you know just me personally you know i had to do some some crime fiction now i'd already done crime fiction but now i had i had to do it you know it was imposed from without rather than me choosing to do it from within now that only lasted a a, a few years and then you know off i went back into supernatural horror at the turn of the century um, but but I'm, I'm now talking too much about myself but the fact is that publishing very gradually was letting it back in um we're not yet seeing i think that the other thing was that uh, there was that whole 
separation into a specific genre as a marketing device in the 70s, which persisted into the 90s. And then it was it was just over. Well, it was there was too much of it, I think, basically, and too much of what was being published was really not very good. Now, in these cases, you you hope that the you know the collapse will take down the bad stuff and leave the you know the, leave the uh, the good stuff somehow up there on standing on a, a however insecure a pinnacle. But often that does not happen. Um, but now you know it's coming back again, and obviously you know other forms of publishing um, are, are changing the whole thing. Uh, you know e-publishing and the like, and and or you know again I'm, I'm, the one thing that I'm especially pleased with about. Uh, flame tree i don't know how many other publishers do this but you know it seems to me to be a, a very positive thing is that they publish simultaneously in print and ebook and audio book and you know so they're covering all the bases and i think very probably you're going to stretch more into the electronics but i honestly don't believe that of course this is really also expressing a hope i don't believe that you know the actual printed medium the book you can hold in your hands and sniff as well if you want to do it you know that that will ever completely die. So, you know, I think, you know, publishing is changing, but it won't altogether cease to be traditional. And as I say, that's what I hope. I think you're right. I don't see books completely going away. I think like, you know, we watched the mass market paperback take a backseat to the trade. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of evolution, I think, is coming still yeah, in yeah. our lives. But I think, I think dead trees are going to be with us. And I yeah. think we should all be proud of that. Yeah, yeah. Ramsey, how can people stay in touch with everything you've got going on and everything that you have coming out? Well, certainly, you know, go, you go to PS Publishing and to, to Flame Tree, go to their website, you'll, you'll see me up there. Or you can look me up on Facebook, if you like, or on Twitter, you'll find me there as well. And um, by then, I'm sure you'll have had more than enough of me. <laughs> I doubt that. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on in and talking. And there's so many of these stories that I feel like we have to get out into the public square because as, as much as technology has given us this amazing ability to spread information, I don't think we do it right. Mostly we, we got to let people talk long form and let them explain their lives and their world. So it's been great hearing from you. You are amazing. You've affected so many people more than you'll ever know. And it's all been positive and good. And uh, we can't wait for the rest of the trilogy. Hey, well, Lord, thank you very much for having me. It was a great, great thing to do. Thank you. Uh, to the audience out there, we are back next Monday. Um, so a week from today um, with Gene Cavellos, uh, the editor of the classic Delibus line that launched so many of those early 90s careers that are so influential today as well. So please come and join and help us celebrate because that's what that show is. That is show is very much a celebration of someone who worked behind the mirror, behind the curtain that probably doesn't get as much recognition as she deserves. And then, of course, uh, Mark Gunnels will be with us on that Friday. And then the show will be taking a little bit of a hiatus for personal reasons. But believe me, we'll be back and strong. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and stay safe. You don't have to do that. I think we do.